You're listening to the National Oceanography Center's Into the Blue podcast, where we tackle some of the biggest questions facing our ocean today by speaking to experts and voices from the world of oceanography. Hope you enjoy today's episode. Hello, I'm Dr. Zoe Jacobs, and today I'm joined by Dr. Jules Kaitar to discuss the impacts of marine heat waves, uh, which are very topical at the moment. So welcome, Jules. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks very much for having me, Zoe. So... As part of the podcast, um, you might have seen, we've been starting with a random ocean question uh, to get into the swing of things. So um, yours is, what is your favourite ocean and why? Yeah, my favourite ocean, probably the Pacific Ocean. Uh, it's uh, the, the one that's closest to my home um, in Melbourne Aww. and uh, Melbourne, Australia, when I was living in Sydney. Um, it's an amazing ocean. You yeah. know, if you, if you look at the planet from, from outer space, it basically, if you look at it the right yeah. side, that's all you see. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely my favorite. Cool. So, um, before we get straight into marine heat waves, um, could you start by talking a bit about your background, uh, your journey to knock, um, because you haven't always been an oceanographer, have you? That's correct. Mm. No. So I joined knock in February of this year. Mm -hmm. So it's been around about six months mm. since I started. Um, but I came from a bit of a different background. So uh, earlier on, I was studying, I had a bit of a fascination with the universe that kind of came from my dad, uh, you know, looking up at the stars in yeah. the night sky. So I started studied astronomy and then, then kind of astrophysics. Mm -hmm. I did a PhD in astrophysics uh, where I studied Einstein's equations of general relativity and, mm -hmm. and numer numerically simulating black holes. Uh, and so it was a little bit later that I kind of got into climate science. Uh, earlier on, I was looking at things like the El Nino Southern Oscillation mm -hmm. and, and how that connects with with other oceans in, in the world. Uh, but more recently, when I joined the University of Tasmania about four years ago, that's when I started getting into marine heat waves. Okay. And uh, yeah, now, now I'm here at NOC and um, hoping to continue on with some of that work. Excellent. Sounds good. Um, so most people have probably heard of or experienced a heat wave on land. Um, especially in the last few years. Um, but what is a marine heat wave? Yes. So just like heat waves mm -hmm. over land, uh, heat waves can occur in the ocean. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we term them marine heat waves. So clearly it's when the ocean temperature is is much warmer than usual mm -hmm. at a kind of an extreme level. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the kind of main difference though, so whilst marine heat waves might not affect us directly mm. in the same way that heat waves over land do, mm. They, they still do have an impact. Yeah. And uh, one of the, the kind of major differences between marine heat waves and mm -hmm. heat waves over land is that they can uh, extend over much larger areas. Yeah. They uh, can warm the ocean to, to kind of deep depths, mm -hmm. to, you know, up to hundreds of metres. And um, they can last much longer as well. So uh, weeks to months in duration. Right. Yeah, so much kind of larger in scale and longer lasting than yes. those on land. Yeah, which I guess could be quite a problem for <laughs> ecosystems and things. Um, can you give me a few examples of some major events that have happened over the last few decades? Yeah, so there was a, a, heat, a marine heat wave that occurred off Western Australia back in 2011, yeah. which was kind of the, one, of the, one of the first major events and actually uh, led to the, the coining of this term, marine yeah. heat wave. So there's, there's this well-known paper that first that first uses this term marine heat mm. wave to describe that event. Uh, that, that particular one was very extreme, uh, caused a lot of impact on the, the local in, in, uh, marine yeah, environment there, impacted mm. uh, kelp, corals, the, the various species around there. There have been other marine heat waves um, of note around the world. So a, again, back to kind of closer to home for me in Australia, in the Tasman Sea, there mm -hmm. have been a number of marine heat waves yeah. in recent years that have caused uh, major impacts to things like uh, oysters, mm -hmm. abalone, mm -hmm. uh, the salmon farming industry there. Yeah. Uh, in the North Pacific, there have been a number of marine heat waves. So you may have heard of yes. the blob and the blob, blob. 2.0. Yes, we love uh, the blob. Yeah. Well, we don't, but yeah, <laughs> we like to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> the, uh, the, these events are increasing. Mm -hmm. uh, they're increasing in their number, their frequency, yeah. um, how long they last, how mm -hmm. intense they are, and, and the impacts that they have. Yeah. And, and so that's the kind of concern. That's why we're trying to yeah. know, work, work on them and understand yes, a bit more Yes, trying to them. understand what's happening. Um, so I guess it's, they're really important to monitor. How exactly do we do that? Yes. So there are a number of tools available to us. Um, mm. and, and there's actually, in terms of monitoring, there's, there's kind of two aspects there. So one is monitoring the, the 
marine heat waves themselves. Yes. But then the second part to that is mon monitoring the impact. Yes. So in terms of monitoring the marine heat waves mm -hmm. themselves, we we obviously rely on temperature observations. One of the key data sets that we have available to us is satellite-based observations of the sea surface temperature. Mm -hmm. And so this is now becoming a kind of quite a valuable long-term uh, data set that's yeah. available to us. So these satellite observations have, have been going since the early 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, daily observations of the global sea surface temperature. So that's yeah. one of the primary tools available to us. Uh, but obviously with that, we only observe the, the, the sea surface mm -hmm. temperature. We also want to get a sense of what's going yeah. on underneath the, the surface. So we also rely on things like moorings yeah. or the Argo float yeah. system yeah. that's now uh, quite um, widespread around yes. the global oceans. And so with these various tools available to us, we're, we're trying to understand, you know, uh, where are these marine heat waves occurring? How are they occurring? Mm -hmm. And um, how intense are they? Yeah. How long are they lasting? Exactly. Um, and we've talked about it already, but um, they must have such a huge impact on the ocean, especially because, as you, as we were saying, they're, they're longer lasting than those on land. Um, so, I, so I can't imagine they're good for corals and kelp and things like that yeah. we've talked about already. Um, what about like fisheries, like the wider ecosystem effects? Yeah. So there, there is a lot. A lot of work that we still need to do to understand yeah. how marine heat waves are impacting various species. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do rely on a lot of these studies that are ongoing into, you know, observing coral, observing uh, kelp systems. Uh, actually, I have a PhD student back in Australia who's mm -hmm. currently doing a project uh, looking at uh, kelp data. So okay. there's now this kind of quite long data set of kelp observations. So divers go down, okay. observe the kelp in mm -hmm. various regions. This is again around Australia. Yeah. And over many years, they've recorded the kelp, the various species that mm -hmm. are there, how they've changed in uh, distribution and size over time. Mm. And so now the, the student, Jiaxin Shi, mm. she's working with this data set to try to understand, well, okay, when these marine heat waves have occurred, how have they impacted the kelp mm. and, and their abundance and yeah. and what species are, are prevalent and, and so on. And so with this type of work, we're trying to understand uh, what, what are those kind of critical temperatures, you know, what, what can the kelp tolerate? Mm -hmm. w at, at what point do they start yes. to suffer? And then, you know, how, how long does the temperature need to exceed mm -hmm. a, a particular threshold mm -hmm. for, for them to, to start experiencing these things? So, yeah, there's a lot of work that's yeah. kind of ongoing into uh, looking yeah. at some of these impacts. Yeah, because I guess we need to, first of all, we need to observe the impacts when it's actually all happening, which is a bit difficult in the ocean, isn't it? Yeah. Um, then we have to kind of understand, is this change reversible? Can the species adapt? All of these things we don't know at the moment, right? Absolutely, yeah. A and actually, another one that you touched on there, you know, fish species. Mm -hmm. uh, so w one of the, the impacts to fish is that, well, fish can swim away from, yes. from temperatures that they don't <laughs> like. Yeah. But then what, what that means is that fish will move into a new environment or a new region. And so people that go out fishing for, for various species may, may find that they're no longer there or they're a different species. Yeah. And so, yeah, I guess that kind of all comes back to, well, why do we care about marine heat waves? And, it, and it's because, like I said at the start, they don't impact us directly, but they do have these indirect effects in that people rely on the marine environment for their food sources, mm -hmm. for their livelihood, millions of people mm -hmm. around the world. And, and these changes affect humanity in that way. And, yeah. and there's, a, there's a huge uh, economic cost to, the, absolutely. to these changes as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially when we start talking about fisheries. I mean, as you say, if the fish can swim away, then I guess the predators also move away. Um, you start to affect things like tourism, especially in the um, for the blob in the Pacific, right? They yep. have like whale watching out there. Absolutely. If everything disappears, you start to affect the tourism industry. The, the things just ripple down the chain. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So they are incredibly important. Um, and as, as we just said, they have a huge impact on society as well. So yeah. Um, so considering what's happening with heat waves on land at the moment, um, I assume it's not good news either for marine heat waves with climate change? Uh, indeed, <laughs> yeah. So so I kind of mentioned that as, as the, the planet's been warming, uh, marine heat waves are becoming more frequent, yeah. more intense, uh, longer in duration, mm -hmm. and and we're expecting this, this kind of trend to, to continue. Yeah. Uh, 
I mean, it's it's also kind of important to note that marine heat waves are not just changing because the kind of mean ocean temperature is changing. Mm -hmm. So obviously, as you increase the mean temperature, the extremes are, are also more likely to increase. But they're also changing because current systems are changing as a, as a result of global yeah, of warming as well. So there are kind of these uh, coupled effects that are going on. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to understand, you know, in which regions might marine heat waves be intensifying more than in, mm. in other regions. And yeah, so th there's a lot to kind of try and pick apart there. Yeah. Are there any kind of regions that are kind of emerging as hotspots? Indeed. Yeah. Um, so the, the Tasman Sea is, yep. is actually one of these kind of known uh, hotspots. So off the southeast mm -hmm. of uh, Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there are others uh, around the, the world. It, look, it looks like the, the kind of Northeast Pacific mm -hmm. is, is kind of one of these hotspots. And, and yeah, there are others. Yeah, and I guess it can kind of change depending on what's driving them. Wondered if we could touch on that. What what do we what is causing these marine heat waves? I guess it varies depending on region. Yeah. So yes, marine heat waves can have can be driven by a number of different ocean processes. Yeah. The the two that we kind of mainly tend to think of, mm -hmm. if we can kind of categorize them into two two broad drivers. Mm -hmm. uh, one is from the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So kind of a when you have some heating from the atmosphere sitting over the ocean, warming the ocean over an extended period, that, that can drive a marine heat wave. The other is from uh, a, a changing current system, so ocean advection. So the current system changes, uh, can bring warmer water mm -hmm. into a region that um, might normally have more, more cooler waters. So there, there are those two effects from the atmosphere or from ocean advection. Yeah, okay. Um, and I wondered if you could comment a little bit on what's going on at the moment because I was looking actually just scrolling on uh, some social media last night looking at kind of what's going on because um, in general for the ocean records are being broken every day at the moment for Antarctic ice loss or temperature or whatever yeah. and I saw that the average temperature of the North Atlantic at the moment is it's just completely obliterated all of its records and it seems to be yes. like one mega heat wave me marine heat wave going on as well at the moment. Yeah, it's um quite scary looking yeah. at these graphs actually. It's I really, know. <laughs> they're really off the charts. Yeah. Um so it's worrying and and where it might be heading to as well. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I I was looking at some plots the other day of North Atlantic temperature. Yeah. Uh, so there was this kind of marine heat wave that occurred around the coast of the UK mm -hmm. back a few weeks ago. I think around about June it kind mm -hmm. of peaked up the the temperatures there but then seemed to subside again a little bit. Uh, but now there's a bit more of a hot spot kind of in more in the, the kind of central North Atlantic, yeah. maybe more on the kind of western side. And temperatures are there are now kind of six degrees above yeah. what they normally are. So it's really kind of scary how, how strong those temperatures are relative to the normal temperatures. Yeah. And yeah, so I'm aware of some work being yeah. undertaken to understand what, what's driving the, those yeah. particular heat waves mm -hmm. and what's going on in the North Atlantic now. I haven't touched on it in my work yeah. myself but uh yeah i know that there are people here at knock that are looking at that yeah good i mean yeah because six degrees above above average doesn't sound a lot when you think about atmosphere because obviously we have daily fluctuations that are like that all the time we're in the uk like it happens <laughs> but but in the ocean that's that is quite a humongous jump yeah. isn't it, in temperature yeah yeah scary scary times <laughs> um so is there any work being done to monitor the impacts of marine heat waves? Um, I know um, I know we talked about um, your PhD student who's looking mm. at the kind of kelp. Um, those are kind of specific isolated areas. Do you know of any other, anything else like that that's going on? Well, so there's also this, uh, the the NOC and, and some people here are involved with this site uh, called the Porcupine Abyssal Plain yeah. observing our site. Mm -hmm. So that that's this area off... Uh, I think it's roughly 500 kilometres off the coast of Ireland yep. to the west. And so that's kind of been a long-term observing site uh, that, that's been helped to have been driven by people at Knock. Mm. And and I know that there are people involved with monitoring the the environment there, what's going on at the seafloor, and and all of that kind of monitoring is really important as well for understanding, mm. well, okay, if, if the temperature is changing or if it, if it spikes up at a certain period of time, what impact does that have? And so, yeah, th those types of direct observing sites are, are really important for, for understanding the, yeah. the types of impacts yeah. that marine heat waves can have. Yeah, definitely. Especially like a long term, the long term trends and things like that. Yeah. Um, 
So I know we're talking about marine heat waves, but I think it's important to just mention that we do have the kind of opposite of that. And yeah. they are called marine cold spells. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. So actually, I, I've had a, another student uh, who I worked with mm -hmm. uh, recently, uh, Yushin Wang, and she did a little bit of work uh, looking into cold spells. Mm -hmm. uh, so marine cold spells. And so what we were trying to do there was understand, well, how. so we, we, we know that marine heat waves are, are kind of increasing in their intensity and duration. Yeah. What, what's happening with cold spells? And uh, I mean, the, the simple answer is that they are decreasing mm -hmm. in, in their intensity and duration, but it's a little bit more complicated that, than that because they don't necessarily exactly follow the same kind of trajectory that the marine heat waves are taking. So we're actually thinking about some other work now, uh, trying to understand how marine cold spells, the cold extremes might change relative to the marine heat waves. Okay. And, and obviously cold spells are important uh, because they can provide a, a refuge or kind of, uh, yeah, uh, yeah th those kind of cooler conditions mm -hmm. are, are quite important for, for the, for particular species yeah. and, and particular life stages of different species. And so understanding about how they might change over time is, is also really important. Yeah, uh, absolutely. For understanding the impacts to ecosystems. Yeah, that's really interesting actually, because I imagine with um, hotspots emerging from marine heat waves, as we were saying, species can need to kind of flee and they might actually permanently move to areas that yeah. where yeah, cold refugia. spells. Yeah, yep. exactly. Yep. Oh, interesting. Mm. Um, okay, so what work is being done at NOC right now on marine heat waves? Yeah, so uh, there, are, there are lots of people I still need to, yes. to <laughs> talk to uh, here at NOC actually, because I'm becoming aware that there are lots of lots of people kind of dabbling with, with marine heat waves mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. So, I mean, my, my personal work has been kind of around marine heat wave predictability. Okay. So trying to understand when and where marine heat waves might occur. Mm -hmm. Can we, can we forecast them in some, some sense? And this is important because particular people in the, uh, as stakeholders in the, in the kind of marine or coastal uh, environment, uh, it, it's, it's quite useful information for them to know if a marine heat wave might occur in say only just a week or two there are things that that people can do to to kind of prepare for these types of mm. events so knowing a little bit more about when and where they might occur and and how strong they might be how long they might last is is all really valuable uh and uh i yeah i mean i mentioned some of my phd students i i have others that are that are working on other topics uh like yeah looking at impacts to other species, mm -hmm. uh, doing high resolution modeling of the kind of coastal region to okay. understand how marine heat waves offshore mm -hmm. might penetrate to the kind of near coastal region. So there's, uh, yeah, lots of really interesting projects yeah. going on. Um, and, and I'm sure lots of others around here yes. at NOC that I'm not aware of as well. Yes, very timely. Yeah. Um, just touching on the forecasting element, if that's the kind of the things you're looking at, ca can we forecast them? Uh, so they can be forecast okay. to some extent. Okay. Um, how good those forecasts is, I guess, is a, is another question, yeah. but I know that this is a kind of increasing, uh, or a kind of question of increasing interest. Mm -hmm. So I know that for example, the, the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia is now starting to develop these marine heat wave forecasting, mm -hmm. uh, products, uh, and Yes, and and so they're they're kind of demonstrating at the moment how how well uh, they they can be forecast. Yeah, and and I guess from the kind of research side where where we fit in is what are the typical patterns yeah. that that tend to be associated with marine heat waves? So I mentioned El Nino earlier. Yeah, there, there's this uh, interesting relationship between La Nina in the Pacific and actually marine heat waves that occur off Western Australia, okay. and uh, it it looks like it tends to that there tend to be more marine heat waves or a higher likelihood of marine heat waves occurring in that region okay. when a La Nina okay. after a La Nina mm -hmm. has occurred. So if we know that a La Nina has occurred yeah. or will occur, we then might know a little bit more about whether a marine heat wave might occur mm, that makes in, sense. in that region or, or other areas. Yeah. So I guess the key really to predictability is understanding what's driving these marine exactly. heat waves, and and this varies. 
hugely, I imagine, from region to region. So yes. we just need lots more research yeah, <laughs> indeed, yeah. on what's driving them. And then, exactly. and then hopefully we can forecast them at some point in the future. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, are there any future projects or plans or directions you'd like to go? Or would, are you sticking to this for kind of forecasting? Yeah. So it's the... Yeah, I, I think probably the predictability yeah. space is is where uh, uh, I'll I'll most likely be heading in the the yeah. brain heatwaves area. I'm actually working on other projects here at, at NOC as well. Yeah. So kind of some of my other projects are involved with understanding the North Atlantic and okay. um, the Atlant Atlantic Meridional yeah. Overturning Circulation, uh -huh. the AMOC. Yeah. So I have some other work going on there. There's there's no actual uh, so in principle there's no direct link between those two, but uh, some people have asked the question as to whether, you know, that that whether we can find a link between the two, you know, whether the changing AMOC has has some implication yeah. for changing marine heat waves, yeah. for example. Cool. Well, um, I guess we'll find out at some point. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks very much for having me. If you're enjoying Into the Blue, please make sure you follow us on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on future episodes. New episodes are released every other Wednesday on all major platforms and are also available to watch on the NOC's YouTube. See you next time.